Good morning, Valley family. It is really good to be with, uh, with, with the family, the church family uh, today, as Susie was saying there. Uh, last week, threw us for a curve, uh, for sure. Um, and uh, Pastor George just did a great job pinch hitting in, in a jam there. It's funny that uh, I'd already alerted him to it like Monday beforehand, uh, just because we've gotten that flight canceled before uh, from Atlanta into White Plains, just individual flight. Uh, we weren't expecting the global technical glitch that canceled like all the flights, but uh, nothing to just build a marriage like 18 hour road trip, the two of us, yeah. And uh, we, we still love each other. We even like each other. Uh, so um, uh, George did this is a great job. And maybe you're here, you know, as a first-time guest, and you're like, what's with all these weird names for God? What kind of church is this? I thought it was a Christian church. It is a Christian church. Uh, the, the fact about the matter is, in the Old Testament, uh, it was not written in English. English wasn't even invented. Uh, it was originally written in Hebrew. And, and English, a lot of times you're reading through the Old Testament, you just see the word God. But in Hebrew... There's over like a hundred different names for the same God. And they all say something about his character. And so that's what we've been doing in this series, aka also known as, we say in English God, but he's also known as these other names in, in the Old Testament. And the New Testament, Jesus is referred to by about a hundred different titles as well. And, and the reason why this is so significant is the Bible says in Psalm 9, 910, those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. So what does that say right there? If we don't know the name of God, that's probably why we don't trust him. Our faith is so much stronger if we actually know his names. And so during this series, during this summer series, my prayer is that every one of us, our faith would grow so much deeper as we discover just some of God's names. Because if we don't know his name, if all we know is God and Jesus, guess what? Our trust is kind of, the roots of our faith are kind of just like barely down under the soil. But those who know his name, trust him. And so week number one, we talked about his name, Elohim, and what Elohim means. Last week, uh, Pastor George, like I said, did a great job going into uh, one of those compound names of God, when he talked about Jehovah Rahi, which is uh, the Lord, my shepherd. And I always want to kind of go back because that name Jehovah is one of the big three names of God in the Old Testament. Elohim, we talked about a couple weeks ago. Jehovah or Yahweh, same name, it's two different languages. Uh, Jehovah or Yahweh we're going to talk about today. Next week we're going to talk about Adonai. Those are the big three names of God in the Old Testament. And then we're going to look at some of those compound names like George uh, uh, did last week all the way up through Labor Day. And that is my sincere prayer and hope that every one of us, we would trust God more because we know his name. And to know his name is to know his character. Every one of his names says something about who he actually is and who he wants to be in each of our lives. People who know God's name trust in him. And so where I'd like to jump in today is in the book of Exodus where uh, God actually speaks to Moses. If you know the story of Moses, the first 40 years, Moses actually was Hebrew, and the Hebrew people uh, were in bondage in Egypt. But he was actually raised as one of Pharaoh's daughter's sons. And, and so he, he grew up in the, the household of Pharaoh, and his people, the Hebrews, were in slavery. He didn't know his true identity. When he discovered his true identity, the Bible records that he actually took an Egyptian soldier's life. And at the age of 40, he had to flee for fear of his life. And so for 40 years, he was actually a shepherd. And, and, and God spoke to him when he was 80 years old as he was a shepherd. And that's where we're going to pick the story up. He says, I want you to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And that's where we're jumping in on the story. I'd like to jump in in Exodus chapter 3, verse 13. And Moses said to God, because this is where God reveals one of his names, and Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites, his own people, and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. That's literally his name. 
I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. I am. I am. In Hebrew, it's kind of, and we'll circle back around to this in a minute, it's kind of pronounced, but not really, Yahweh. Yahweh. In English, that Yahweh is translated as Jehovah in English. And the, the, the trouble is, this word for God, I am, it has no vowels in it. The vowels were put in just so we can actually speak that name. It's considered the unspeakable name of God. And we'll talk about that in just a second, why it's unspeakable. Yahweh, it's literally Y-H-W-H if we were using our alphabet. There are no vowels in it. In English, it's translated as Jehovah. It's really considered the same name. Jehovah is the Anglic Anglicanized version of that Hebrew name for God that, that is written Y-H-W-H in the Hebrew Bible. The name Jehovah is a combination of the consonants that you see there, Y-H-W-H, -H, and the vowels from the name of God, Adonai, which we're gonna talk about next week which means Lord, it means God, large and in charge. And so they took the, the vowels from Adonai, put it into Yahweh, just so it was even a word that could be spoken because it's the unspeakable name of God. And I'll explain that in a sec. Jehovah is commonly used in English translations of the Bible and in Christian theology. It's in one of the names, we say God in English, but it's more specific than that in Hebrew. Yahweh is more accurate pronunciation of what's called the tetragrammaton. The tetragrammaton, that is the spelling of Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, -H, the tetragrammaton. So now when you get home and, you know, tomorrow at work someone says, what'd you learn in church? You can tell them, I learned about the tetragrammaton. How about that? Everyone turn to your friend and say tetragrammaton right now. Some of the, just say tetragrammaton so you can pronounce it correctly. There you go. It's the unspeakable name of God, Yahweh. You can impress people for years with that, the Tetragrammaton. I had a hard time even spelling it. There's three important truths that I think we need to know about God's name, and I'll use the English Jehovah. The first is this, Jehovah is present with you in every circumstance. In every circumstance of your life, Jehovah is present with you. It literally means, when he says, my name is I am, it means he is present tense. It's not that he was past tense, he was. Not he will be. In the past, he was I am. In the present, he is I am. In the future, he is I am. God has always existed because he's eternal. The name Jehovah reveals that God is eternal. He's the creator. The tense of the verb is the present tense and he's always present, which means that Jehovah will be with you in every situation you ever find yourself with. Every situation you ever find yourself, he's with you. He's not far, he's close. This is the personal name of God. This is the up close name of God, Jehovah. The name of Jehovah shows that God is, pers is a person who wants to relate to his people. When God told Moses to go back to Pharaoh and to bring God's people out of Egypt, Moses said, what's your name? And he says, I am. I am. I'm personal and I want to be personal with my people, the Hebrews in the Old Testament at the time. In revealing his personal name to Moses, God proved that he wanted to build a relationship with Moses and with the Israelites. He said, I am. I'm per this is a personal thing. I'm not distant. I'm not aloof. I'm not some faraway, you know, fuzzy-headed grandpa that's forgotten about his creation. I am, up close and personal. The name of Jehovah proves that God is also self-existent. He's self-existent. When God revealed himself, to me, he's like, I always have been. What does that mean? It means God's existence doesn't depend on anyone else or anything else. 
He doesn't owe his existence to parents or another creator, but he exists himself. He created time. He stands outside of all of it. I am. Before time was, before light was, before day and night was, I am. He has always been and he will always be. God is the only completely self-sufficient and self-generating being in all the universe. I am. And yet the name also says, I'm personal and I want to be close to you. The name Jehovah shows that God doesn't change. If God is self-existent and eternal, the essence of his name must also be changeless over time. He is the same, the Bible says, yesterday, today, and forever. How? Because he is I am. Not I was or I will be. I am all the time. God is the creator. He's the sustainer of all the stars, all the galaxies, and he doesn't change. Even though we experience shadows as the earth rotates and seasons, our seasons change, God does not change. He's I am, always the same. Even Bible verses that sometimes are a little tricky for us to understand that talk about that, that God changed his mind, it doesn't mean that his essence or his character changed. It just means he adjusted his actions. As an example, uh, in Galatian, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 6, verse 6, he adjusted his actions because of the sin and judgment that had to come upon wicked people. He didn't change. He just adjusted his actions. That's what the Bible means when it says that God changed his mind. He didn't change his character. He didn't change who he was, just the action that he was taking. Second thing that we need to know about Jehovah that's so important is Jehovah wants to make himself known to you personally. That's the whole essence of what he told Moses. He's like, I'm ready to reveal myself personally to my people who are in bondage in Egypt. Who do I send? Who do I say sent me? I am. I am that I am. Let's look at the beginning of the story. We kind of jumped in the middle. Exodus 3, verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, which is the mountain of God. And there an angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within the bush. And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. And so Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. God wants to make himself known to you and me just like he did to Moses. That where he is, by the way, he's everywhere. It's holy ground. When Jehovah appeared to Moses in that flaming bush, it was really confusing and challenging circumstance. And the fact about the matter is, in your life and my life, it's in the confusing and challenging circumstances of life that God wants to truly reveal who he is to you and to me, likewise. It's very interesting, depending on what English translation you read, it says that Moses saw the burning bush that was not engulfed, it was not consumed in the flame. And he said, and when he turned to look, then God spoke to him from it. Can you imagine for just a minute if Moses had decided not to look? If Moses was too busy, he was, he was trying to get to his next activity that he had planned, his next event that he had planned, if he had not turned to look, he never would have discovered Jehovah and the people of Israel would have never been delivered. I wonder how many times you and I are so busy because of all that we've got planned that we don't have time to turn and look and God's waiting for us to give him our attention. When he turned and looked, that's when God spoke to him, not before. When he turned and focused on this unusual situation and circumstance, that's when God revealed himself to him. Moses' curiosity caused him to stop and to look at the bush. 
That's when Jehovah called Moses' name and told him it was time to lead his people out of Egypt. Jehovah told Moses to take off his shoes and to respect the holy ground that he stood on, to remind Moses that he was actually in control. He didn't even want a thin strap of leather underneath Moses' feet. He said, you're standing on holy ground. You're standing before I am that I am. This is different. You need to acknowledge who I am and what is happening right now. Kind of reminds me, gotten a lot of people asking me questions about, uh, what did you think about the opening ceremonies of the Olympics? And uh, I, I thought this would be a good place to talk about when we're talking about God says, I'm holy. You're standing on holy ground. The things of God are holy. They're set apart. They're supposed to be different than this world. Number one, I wasn't surprised. Why do we think that the world is actually going to be kind and acknowledge the goodness of the creator God? Why do we think that? I wasn't surprised at all. It was depraved. It was hideous. It was obnoxious. And that was what it was meant to be. I think one of the silliest things is all these ridiculous explanations because of the pushback of two billion Christians in the world saying that is wrong. But for us as Christians, we need to understand something. That when the world rebukes us and ridicules us, it's because we're doing the right thing. It's because we're different. And so we need to wear this as a badge. Badge of honor. It means that when we're the light of the world, light only shines where? In the darkness. In the darkness. And the darkness always wants to extinguish the light. But we're truly being who we're supposed to be. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, they ridiculed him. If, you believe, if you're really the son of God, save yourself and come down for that. They completely ridiculed him. They hated him and they hate you and I because we look like him because we're different. And so we shouldn't be offended by this. We should recognize this as an opportunity to identify with our Savior who was also ridiculed, who was also rebuked. What my concern is, is for many Christians, we're living in a fool's paradise and believe in all the, the spin of thinking this world is becoming a better place. It's not. It's getting worse and worse and worse, where that is entertainment now for the world. The Bible says this world is not getting better. Day after day, week after week, year after year, it's getting worse and worse. And Jesus is the only one who can fix it when he returns again. And so God says the things of God, I am, they're holy. They're supposed to be rever revered and reverential, and honored, and respected. Not by the world, the world's never gonna honor those things, but by the people of God. When Moses turned to Jehovah, the burning bush, Jehovah gave him a new plan and a new purpose for his life. And when you and I, each one of us as an individual, when we turn to God in the middle of circumstances and situations that are confused and don't make sense, guess what God does for you and me? He gives us a new purpose and a new plan for our lives, just like he did Moses. You'll never know why you're on this planet until you turn and look at God and allow him to tell, this is the purpose I created you for. When Moses turned and looked, he received a new plan and a new purpose, the purpose he was created by God for. Jehovah reveals himself personally. That's what his name literally means, the name Jehovah. When he created all that we see in the beginning. A couple of examples of this, just think about it, in the Garden of Eden. By planting a garden for Adam, Jehovah revealed himself as a loving provider. I'm gonna take care of humanity. I'm gonna take care of you, if you'll trust me. By providing a companion, Adam and Eve and Eve for Adam, Jehovah revealed himself as a caring God as well. See, here's something I think is so important when we think about this name Jehovah. Satan wants to keep you from knowing God personally as Jehovah. He wants to do all he can. He is, Satan is all excited when we get religious. He just doesn't want you and I to have a relationship with God. Religion doesn't bother him at all. In fact, he uses it a lot. 
But he does not want you and I to know God as Jehovah, a personal, growing, close relationship with God. In fact, it's interesting, just just to prove this statement here, in Genesis chapter 3, when, when Satan took the form of the serpent and went to tempt Eve, it's very interesting in Hebrew what actually says happens there. Look at it, and I'll try to explain it. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals and the Lord that the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Where it says Lord God there, those are actually two Hebrew words, Jehovah Elohim. We talked about Elohim, that's Lord. God here is Jehovah, Jehovah Elohim. So it says Elohim, Lord God is Jehovah Elohim, is the God of all creation who created everything, but he's also the personal God, Jehovah. That's what the Bible says. But look at what the serpent does. When he comes to tempt her, he purposely drops out the word Jehovah because he does not want to remind Eve, God is personal and caring for you. Did God, that's just Elohim. It was Jehovah Elohim that did all that in the garden. But when he comes to tempt her, he just says, did Elohim, the big God, who's epic and huge and large, he did not want to remind Eve, you have a personal relationship, Jehovah, a relationship with God. That's why he doesn't mind us being busy with religious stuff. What he does not want under any circumstances is for you and I to have a daily growing relationship with Jehovah, the personal God. Satan wanted Eve to forget that she had a relationship with Jehovah because then it would be easier for her to disobey God. And when you and I forget that we have a personal relationship with God, it's real easy to do things that God has told us will be destructive to our life and destructive to those around us as well. Here's the third thing about Jehovah I think is really important. We need to make time to get to know Jehovah. It doesn't happen by accident. We need to make time to get to know him. Getting to know Jehovah takes time. It takes priority. After spending a lot of time with Jehovah uh, in the wilderness, he, God used Moses to bring, by his hand and the power of God, to bring out uh, the people of, of Israel out of bondage for hundreds and hundreds of years. 40 years they're in the desert. And, and come up on Exodus chapter 33. And Moses had spent a lot of time getting to know God. And the more he got to know God, the more he wanted to know about God. And in Exodus 33, verse 7 and 11, you can read it for yourself. He says, show me your glory. God, would you show me your glory? Like, I... I, I've gotten to know you and I'm getting to know you more and more and more. The more you know of God, that's why also I think this series is so important, the more you want to know him. It's inexhaustible. I'll give you an example. Have you ever like met someone you just wanted to get to know better? Like maybe it was just, just a couple minutes, you're like, man, I'd really like to get to know them better. It happened to me when I was a senior in high school. I, I went on a college visit to a, a college that I was considering attending and I met this beautiful blonde with this huge permed hair and her name was Susie Warner at the time. And I'll never forget the moment I saw her on my college visit. I'm 18 years old. It's February, my senior year at John Jay High School. And I'm like, but like, like, psh. of course I didn't do it. I was like, cool. So. And I just remember in my mind, like wanting to get to know her. That was pretty much like it was, wasn't it? Yeah, no, not really. Okay, anyway. But, but, and I decided to go, she was, already, she was a year ahead of me in college. I decided to go to that college. I wanted to get to know her better. First time I met her. First week of school, we're sitting there, a bunch of students in the snack bar, like 10 of us sitting at a table, and one by one, they got up, they went to class and all. And it was like something you'd see on a Hallmark movie. It ended up being just Susie and I. And we sat there and we talked for hours, hours and hours. They literally swept the whole floor around us, mopped it, put the chairs up on the tables all around us. And they're like, when you're done, turn the lights out, you know. 
And, we just, and I'd never, ever opened up to anyone before. And with Susie, just something happened and the guard just dropped. Next month, we'll be celebrating 34 years of marriage. We've been a couple. She, she's been my girlfriend for 36 years. And I'd be a fool if I stood before you today and said, I know everything there is to know about her. She's a riddle wrapped with, in a question, sealed, you know, with, with uh, I don't know what. It's just like, how could, who, what man honestly could ever say he knows a woman? The more I get to know her, the more I want to get to know her. That's just a drop in the bucket compared to how God wants it to be in our relationship with him. The more Moses got to know him, and the Bible says that he spoke to him face to face, the more Moses wanted to get to know him. That's Jehovah. That's who he is. Moses asked to see his glory, so Jehovah revealed his name and his character to Moses in Exodus chapter 33, verse 18. See, I think too many of us are just satisfied with just an introduction to Jehovah. That's why we don't trust him. That's why our faith is weak. That's why when circumstances and situations come, they shake us instead of knowing his name, who he really is, and that relationship getting stronger and stronger, deeper and deeper every single day. And so here are just a few of God's compound names. So last week, uh, George talked about one of them. I want to give you, this isn't even an exhaustive list. There's, like I said, I think there's close to 100 of these compound names in the Bible. All of them say, this is just in the Old Testament, all of them say something specific about who Jehovah is, who God really is. First of all, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. In Exodus chapter 17, verse 15. In other words, it's like he's the flag. He goes before me. That's the Lord is my banner. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace or the Lord is my peace. Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Jehovah Rohi, this is what Pastor George talked about last week. The Lord is my shepherd. Jehovah Shama, the Lord is there. Ezekiel 48, 35. Jehovah Elohim, the Lord God. Genesis 2, 4. Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. 1 Samuel 1, 7. These compound names of God provide insights into the different aspects of his character and his nature and relationship with his people that are revealed in the Old Testament scriptures. Which one of these do you need to know more about in your life? Maybe it's Jehovah Jireh, the God who will provide. When the financial pressure and stress gets tough and inflation keeps soaring higher and higher, if you don't know Jehovah Jireh, God will provide, you'll get really stressed out and full of fear and anxiety. But when you understand that God says, I will provide all that you need, according to my riches and glory, you can just relax. Because it's not even what he does, that's who he is. Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. And this is not an exhaustive list, there's so many other names of God. Those who know his name, trust him. Is it possible the reason why we have difficulty trusting God, we're just satisfied with an introduction to him? We don't really know his name. When you're in a mess, when you're facing uncertainty, don't just look at it, look for, G, look for God because he's about to call your name and introduce you to another dimension of who he is, another dimension of Jehovah. To get to know Jehovah better, we must make our relationship with him a priority. And Paul the apostle, he understood this. In fact, in the New Testament, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 through 11, listen to what Paul said to the Christians at Philippi. I once thought these things were valuable. He's talking about all of his accolades and his achievements, Pharisee of the Pharisee, all all these things. But I now consider them worthless 
because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He's like, nothing in this world matters. Nothing compared to knowing Jesus Christ as Lord, who he really is. He said, for his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all garbage. And that word garbage is pretty interesting there in the original language of the New Testament. It's a Greek word. Let me try to clean it up because it's not a clean word at all. It's poop. Like literally, Paul is saying, all these worldly, worldly accolades are just poop compared to knowing Jesus Christ. They, they, they stink. There's nothing to them. There's no value in them at all. He says, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with him depends on faith. And then he says it again in case we didn't hear it the first time. I want to know Christ. Wait a minute, you want to know him? This is Paul who, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament that we read today. Two-thirds of the New Testament. He goes, I haven't even scratched the surface of knowing God. All of this time, all that Paul went through, he goes, but I want to know him more. I want to know him more. I haven't seen anything yet of who he really is. I want to know Christ and experience, watch this now, the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him. That's what I'm talking about, this whole response to the Olympic opening ceremonies. That's a privilege. That's an honor that the world is making fun of us, the things we hold dear, because we're doing something right, because they mocked him as well. And so we're being counted in that we're with him. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Paul willingly walked through suffering and difficulty, not whining and complaining about it, but in order to get to know new facets of Christ's character as a sovereign caring, loving Jehovah. Let me end with this. If we could go back to, yeah, that slide there. As I said, to try to make sense of this from Hebrew into English, Jehovah is English. In Hebrew, they put the vowels in there Again, from the name Adonai of God that we'll talk about next week. Just so it's something that we can even speak. Because how do, you, how do you pronounce a word that has no vowels? It's really impossible in the English language. In the truest sense, Yahweh is not the way that you say this name. It's the unspeakable name. You know what? Because to say the name properly, you don't really even move your tongue. You don't even move your lips. The way that you actually say this name, this unspoken name of God, it's pronounced like this. Think about it for just a minute. When a baby is born, the first word that a baby speaks is not mommy or daddy. It's the relational name of God. Our granddaughter's a month old. She's absolutely brilliant, the most perfect child ever born. She said her first word when she was five seconds old. Not five months or five weeks, five seconds. One day, every one of us will 
breathe our last breath. And the last word on our lips will be the relational name of God. As we release the breath of God back to him who gave it to us to begin with. Listen, there are times in this life pain is so much going on is so hard we're faced with so much and we're completely overwhelmed and words escape us but all you need to do is just (sighs) and God hears you called his name (sighs) he's closer to you than the breath in your lungs That is his sacred, holy name that we translate from Hebrew to even have to put vowels in it to make it make sense. Yahweh into English, Jehovah. That's how close he is. Do you know Jehovah today? Do you know He wants you to know him. Eternity will not be long enough for us to know him fully and completely. That's how powerful. That's how immense. That's how holy he is. And he loves each and every one of us personally, totally, and completely. And he wants every one of us to know him as Yahweh. Yeah. Would you bow your heads with me right now? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, there's so much that we don't know about you. There's so much we just don't understand. But Lord, it is true, the more that we know you, the more we want to know. Thank you for being here today with us, the great I am. Father, continue to draw us closer to you. God, I pray that each and every one of us would pursue you and know you deeply, growing daily, personally, with you, Yahweh, Jehovah. Father, thank you that eternity is not gonna be long enough for us to know and learn all about you. We look forward to that day, but now we look forward to today and tomorrow and every day after on this planet that we can grow in the knowledge of you and know your name and trust you in a deeper way. We ask this, Father, Jehovah, Yahweh, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.